our discussion of synchronization of estrus now um, progresses to the point where we're going to talk about GNRH based protocols. These protocols have become widely used, um, particularly in the United States, and they're based on the physiological response that can occur in randomly cycling cows if you inject gonadotrophin releasing hormone. Gonadotrophin releasing hormone, as we've covered earlier, will induce ovulation uh, if a mature follicle is present that has enough LH receptors on it and then this will result in new wave emergence occurring one to two days later and then if we inject prostaglandin about seven days after injecting this first injection of GnRH luteolysis will occur because this will induce the formation of a corpus luteum as ovulation occurs and there also may be an existing corpus luteum present so injecting prostaglandin seven days after GnRH causes luteolysis a decline in progesterone cows come into proestrus and then we get a rise in estrogen and an LH surge and uh, ovulation will occur out here but we can tighten up the pattern of ovulation by giving a second injection of GnRH to ovulate this mature dominant follicle. We can then artificially inseminate cows um, after injecting GnRH or at the same time as injecting GnRH. And so a number of protocols have been associated with this basic off sync protocol. So that's some of the physiological basis for these GnRH based protocols and the whole group of variants in protocols uh, revolve around this basic protocol. So as I mentioned these are widely used in the US today. They're fairly simple to use, just involve giving injections. Um, they have some effect on non-cycling cows, so if a cow is not, not ovulating, it's not undergoing estrous cycles, then by injecting GnRH you can ovulate some of those cows and get some of them pregnant. The costs tend to be less than using a cedar or a cumate because um, they're cheaper, um, but they're generally more expensive than just using, say, a double prostaglandin pro protocol. Conception rates can be quite variable. Um, they're higher risk programs. Sometimes you get good responses, sometimes you get poor responses, and it really depends on how well the cows respond to those injections of GnRH and it's a little bit difficult to predict sometimes. When you're using these programs most cows don't show heat so you are actually inseminating cows um, that are not showing heat. Um, some of them will but many of them won't and that's because by the time you give that second injection of GnRH the rise in estrogen that's occurring may not get the rise may not get high enough to induce estrous behavior because when you come in with your second injection of GnRH you change those granulosa cells into corpus luteum cells, they become luteinized and instead of secreting estrogen they start to prepare to secrete progesterone. So concentrations of estrogen may not get as high um, during the proestrous period so not, not as many cows will come in heat. This can be an advantage in um, a herd that's being fed for example on concrete or housed on concrete with a total mixed ration, you don't want a lot of these cows showing excessive signs of heat because they can wear their feet out a bit and, and have injuries slipping on concrete. If farmers are having trouble detecting heat, because we're not relying on the detection of heat, we're just inseminating at a fixed time, or what we call timed AI, then they don't have to worry about heat detection with the standard protocol. Unfortunately the protocols are not generally recommended for heifers, although there are protocols for heifers, um, because some of the response rates can be lower. And that's because the percentage of cows or heifers that have a follicle that's mature enough at the time that you give that first injection of GnRH may be less than compared to cows. So the response rate from the first injection is generally less. Now you might say, why do heifers have a reduced response rate? That's because their follicles are growing more rapidly um, and they're turning over, becoming dominant, nitretic, etc., um, more rapidly than in cows. So the probability at any one time that you have a mature follicle present that's got enough LH receptors to respond to LH at a random stage of the estrous cycle is going to be a little bit la lower in heifers than in cows. Cows have a slower um, growth rate of follicles. The mature follicle stays on the ovary a little bit longer uh, before it becomes atretic. And so the probability that when you inject GnRH at random, you're more likely to ovulate 
a follicle in a cow than you are in a heifer. And that's one of the reasons why the off-sync or the GnRH-based protocols do not work as well in heifers as in cows. Here's a, um, a variety of um, different combinations of using GnRH-based protocols. The main protocol is what we call off-sync, and so you should be familiar with this, this protocol here. Um, involves injecting GnRH on day zero, prostaglandin seven days later, and then two days later an injection of GnRH, and then about 16 hours later timed artificial insemination. This GnRH injection here induces an LH surge within a few hours, and so this sets up cows to ovulate 24 to 28 or so hours uh, later. And so if you put semen in about 16 hours after GnRH, then you'll have semen um, viable sperm present when the oocyte ovulates. A variation to this protocol is called what we call co-sync. It's the same protocol as the off-sync protocol with the exception that on day 9, um, GnRH and AI occur at the same time. And you can this this saves one treat one yarding of cattle, so it's it's particularly adva advantageous in beef cows, where you don't want to yard the cows as often. Now, in some protocols, this day nine injection may extend to day ten, so that you will see some variations in people that inject on day nine, or some people that inject an AI on day ten. Uh, heat sink. Um, this is the same as the off sync protocol, GnRH PG, but instead we replace the second injection of GnRH with an injection of estradiol benzoate or another form of estrogen. And then we, AI, we detect heat and AI on day 9, and anything that's not in heat um, that, that hasn't been inseminated is fixed time inseminated on day 10. Now, this obviously because estrogen is not allowed to be used in lactating dairy cows, we can't use this protocol in lactating dairy cows. What's the advantage of this? The injection of estrogen is a little bit cheaper than the injection of GnRH. Um, disadvantage is you've got to detect heat here, so AI is spread over two days here instead of a single day here. Select sync. Um, this is a, a situation where you're injecting GnRH, PG, and then you're just detecting heat and AI for the next few days after that. So this, this relies on adequate um, heat detection. All of these programs are really dependent on this first injection of GnRH, uh, getting a good response rate to this first injection. One way that um, researchers have come up to try to improve the response to this first injection is to undertake a range of treatments prior to injecting GnRH to try to ensure that we have a mature um, dominant follicle with adequate number of LH receptors present when we give this injection of LH. So there's a variety of protocols that can be applied here to increase the percentage of that ovulate following the administration of GnRH on day zero. I'll go into that in a little bit, a little bit later. But what I can say is that obviously any treatments that you do back here are going to increase the workload and the cost associated with these programs and the time that it takes to, to, to complete one of these programs. So for this reason, not every herd owner will be willing to do these pre-synchronization protocols, even though response rates uh, d generally improve to the first injection. Not every study has shown an, ex an advantage of pre-synchronization, but some have. But it does increase workloads and it does increase cost, and, and increases the time that it takes to get to um, AI. This is just an illustration um, from a textbook outlining some of the physiological outcomes that you expect from using a traditional off-sync program. So when you inject GnRH in a, ran in a group of randomly cycling cows, um, you'd only expect approximately 70% to ovulate. Sometimes it's as low as 50% of the cows will ovulate. That means that the other 30 to 50% of cows, you haven't controlled emergence of a new follicular wave. And so they may, they may come in heat at any stage during this process. And so if you're fixed time inseminating out here, then if you haven't controlled the follicular wave and the cow comes in heat here or here, then that animal's not going to get pregnant. So that's a reason, one of the reasons why we can get a res reduced response to the off-sync protocol if this injection of GnRH here doesn't work. And we expect it not to work in, in approximately 30%, even up to 50% of animals. When we inject prostaglandin on day 7, most animals will undergo luteolysis, but it's not 100% of animals. 
and so the rate of luteolysis may be 95% and it can be even lower in some studies. After we inject prostaglandin, two days later we inject GnRH. Generally speaking, um, if GnRH back here, the first injection of GnRH, induced a new follicular wave then and prostaglandin worked, then most of those new follicles will ovulate and so the treatment will be a success. If we haven't controlled follicular waves back here and then we've just got waves coming up at different time intervals then not all of them will respond to this second injection of GnRH and it may be as low as 60% of those that actually respond. So that's why it's very important if possible if we can design a strategy to make this first injection work in a high percentage of cases. But having said that most of the time this protocol in the majority of animals does synchronize ovulation but in some animals for the reasons I've just outlined it may not synchronize ovulation. Now this is just uh, what we call a hybrid synchronization protocol where we're applying just the standard of sync protocol GnRH, PG and then here we're going GnRH plus AI so we're doing a co-sync protocol um, but what we're doing is we're also detecting heat during this period of time. What that allows for is that if this injection does not synchronize new wave emergence then any animal that's not synchronized we may be able to detect um, them in heat during this period and as soon as we detect them in heat we'll AI them. Any animal that hasn't been inseminated um, within 72 hours of this PGF injection here um, is then uh, inseminated and administered GnRH2. So it's a hybrid protocol it involves heat detection. We heat detect for a while an AI and then at about three or so days later we call it quits and we AI the animals and inject them with GnRH. So it's a hybrid protocol. It requires more work. There's heat detection involved here so some disadvantages there but pregnancy rates will generally be higher than with an OVSYNC protocol simply because we're detecting animals that that come in heat prior to uh, when we, we would expect them to come in heat if GnRH had worked. So it's not a bad option for farmers who can heat detect and don't mind putting in a little bit of extra work. Just returning back to the concept of pre-synchrony, um, the aim here is to improve the percentage of follicles that respond to the first injection of GnRH during the OVSYNC product protocol or one of the variations to the OVSYNC protocols. It's shown to have some advantages in some studies. It does increase the cost of, of the programs and the number of times that animals must be handled and treated. So there are some disadvantages with using it. And there's a range of strategies and these are just a few. Um, for example, before we give the first injection of PG as part of the off-sync protocol, we can give two injections of prostaglandin at an interval of 14 days which will synchronize most animals to come in heat and then we'll start off sync about 12 to 14 days later. And what this means is that most animals will have a mature dominant follicle at the time of starting the off sync protocol. Alternatively we can, we can inject PG, um, just give them one injection of prostaglandin, detect heat and AI for about three days. Then animals that have not been detected in heat or AI hopefully will have a more mature dominant follicle present and we can start the GnRH protocol. Another protocol is a, what they call a G6G OVSYNC protocol where cows start with it by administering an injection of prostaglandin. This will juice most cows or not all but a lot of cows into proestrus. We then give them GnRH about two days later and about six or so days later we start the OVSYNC protocol. And another protocol is what we call double off-sync, where we actually administer an off-sync protocol prior to starting the off-sync protocol where we would AI cows. And this is outlined in this table here. So we start an off-sync protocol um, by injecting GnRH, then PG, then GnRH. And then the following week um, we start um, our um, uh, off-sync protocol and AI out here. And you can see that it requires a number of weeks to undertake this protocol and it requires quite a lot of treatments. Um, so it's not commonly done in most herds in Australia but it, it can be done in some herds where 
it's deemed that they want to get a better response to the standard off sync protocol. This is another variation that's been developed over the last few years. It, it, there's been the realization that with uh, a, um, uh, some of the GNRH based protocols, that not every cow will undergo luteolysis when giving this injection of prostaglandin. So this has been overcome by giving two injections about 8 to 12 or so hours apart. By giving two injections of prostaglandin, the rate of luteolysis here increases. And this has been able to improve the responses and fertility in some but not all studies. The other thing that it has enabled to do, it means that the, the, the tri if you're using a CETA based protocol, um, the, the interval from GNRH injection to, remove, to removing the CETA and injecting prostaglandin can re be reduced from 7 down to 5 days. And this shortens the protocol a bit. Um, GNRH and AI generally occur about, 30, about 3 days after uh, removal of the uh, CETA device. So this is just a slight variation. It involves shortening the protocol um, and giving two injections of prostaglandin uh, to increase the rate of luteolysis. And it has shown some benefit in some studies but not in other studies. Again, increases the cost, but um, some people have adopted the use of this protocol. These are just some experimental uh, or trial results um, from Australian and New Zealand herds just using a standard off-sync protocol. I just wanted to illustrate a couple of things. First of all, you can see that the percentage of animals that are pregnant um, on the first day of AI, that is uh, following the initial off-sync treatment, only about 30 to 36 percent, 37 percent of animals are getting pregnant. So you're really only getting about a third of the herd, a bit more than a third of the herd pregnant from the off-sync protocol on average um, in both Australia and New Zealand. So this is not as high as what we would like um, but um, nevertheless it does show you that with a few injections you can get uh, quite a few animals pregnant. Just note also that the number of cows that were non-cycling at the time of starting the off-sync protocol you can get some of those pregnant and it's actually quite a few actually get um, quite a few of them pregnant. You can see that the rate of pregnant, the pregnancy rate in New Zealand was slightly higher than it was in Australia. It's partly because the type of animals are slightly different. We tend to have larger um, uh, cows with a higher component of United States Holstein genetics and so the fertility tends to be less than in New Zealand. Within six weeks of commencing the, the off-sync protocol uh, and AIing and then the rest of this, the season cows were inseminated on heat detection you can see that about 60% of cycling animals um, became pregnant in Australia and about 77% of cycling animals in New Zealand. And you can see the non-cycling animals had a better response rate in New Zealand than in Australia. So all this is really illustrating that off-sync when used in pasture-based dairy cows in both Australia and New Zealand can achieve um, reasonable pregnancy rates although we'd all prefer those pregnancy rates to be higher and there is some response in non-cycling cows. So what are the general indications for using off-sync? Well if you're having trouble detecting heat um, or you're not accurately detecting heat then just using a simple injection protocol and fixed time AI will help overcome some of the losses that you may be incurring from poor heat detection. If you're reluctant to practice continuous heat detection, so you just want a simple program, you want to get all the cows inseminated on one day, then it's not a bad alternative. It's relatively simple to implement. Um, will it treat anestrous cows? In my opinion, it's not the most physiological treatment for this purpose, but it will result in some anestrous cows becoming pregnant. Um, so it can be used in non-cycling cows. If you include a CEDA or a QMATE device between day 0 and 7 or day 0 and 5 with the shorter protocol, then you will generally improve responses. This is because the presence of progesterone will inhibit any cows that GNRH has not worked on that may be coming in heat normally here. It will stop them coming in heat and will make them come in heat out during this period here. So we'll, we'll, we should improve our pregnancy rates a little bit. Any cows that are not cycling at the time, the 
presence of progesterone will prime the hypothalamus, reduce the sensitivity of the hypothalamus to estrogen negative feedback and increase the probability that they'll actually respond and become and ovulate and become pregnant out here. So a few reasons to include a CEDAR or a Qmate device between the first injection of GnRH and injection of PG. Disadvantage, it increases the cost of the program. There are many other protocols that are available. Um, the, main, uh, what I'd, the main thing I'd like you to be able to do is to look at a protocol and be able to understand how it works and what are the advantages and disadvantages of the protocols. And there are some handouts that I've included in the notes and some websites that you can look at to try to examine and have a look at some protocols. Here are some review questions which you can look at. Um, so I suggest you pause the tape, have a look at these. And I've got a couple of these questions and I've got some answers that follow. And again, some another question and some answers that follow. So have a view of, review of these questions and then review the answers and see how you go.